Hey everyone, this is Troy from Ampeg. We're at NAM 2018. Stoked to have Rex Brown and Mike Inez with us. Thanks for coming down, guys. Oh, well, thank you for having us. Our pleasure. You have fresh coffee, and it's coffee. much this late in the NAM show. Uh, Saturday, we appreciate it. <laughs> All right, on guys. You have been buds for years. How did that come about? Where did you guys meet, and what's the origins? It's funny, the bass players in general. Well, mine and Rex is uh, is definitely a special relationship. We've been like brothers for since since the first night we met, really. And bass players are like, "Hey, I got that same Mickey Mouse watch. We should be brothers for life, right?" That's the way bass players are. So that's, that's I can't, how we met, yeah, that's, basically. That's kind of like that, yeah. They both have the same Mickey Mouse watch. Amazing. Well, I mean, you, you go backstage yeah. in any concert, all the bass players are standing together. Yeah. You know, it's like. We it's don't want to take society. Yeah, yeah, we and and it, we keep the band rolling because we are the roll. They got the rock. We take the roll. You know, it's the way I look at it. All right, Rex. Let's talk about your new album, Smoke. On this came out a little bit ago. You want to talk about how that came about? Uh, you've been in bands ever since, but this is your first solo album. I went was writing some songs with a friend that lived in Nashville, and went down for a NAM and I I was basically uh, sitting on the back of a bus after 25 years and said I've had it I'm burnt I'm crisp and after that all of a sudden these bricks started coming and hit me right in the back of the head and um, Warwick came into the deal and and um, and I started writing these songs and I said man let me sing on this one track you know because I know I can do it and uh so we found this voice that fit with a lot of these songs that we were writing. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take the chance. I funded this thing myself. I said, I'm going to take the chance and just step out of my own and, and do something that I've always wanted to do in the first place, which is make music that I love to do. I had the best time making that record. You just, you get in the studio and you just have that, that, freedom and something magical happens and that whole session i mean it, it, it lasted over it was like a 16-month process but it was having fun making music again so uh you did guitar bass vocals and uh, you had, rhythm guitar you know and i had a main uh main guitar player that did all the other stuff but i bet it made you appreciate like the other guys in the band like you know, oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and it's been singing, singing and playing guitar we did. and you know that's a hard job singing and it's a whole it's a whole different animal than playing bass you know i'm proud of you Rex. it's, it, it's kind of like these lost chords in your head you know that you do you have you know i had songs written that i couldn't have used for this band or say down or you know Nothing went back to the Pantera days, but um, there were certain things that I just wanted to do, man. And I got tired of being pigeonholed as just that bass player because I can do so much more. So, uh, are any plans to tour behind it? Uh, yes, in May. And uh, will the set list have from all your bands that you've done previously, or is this your solo, your solo stuff only, and that's what you're touring on? That's what you're going to play. That, that's it. In fact, I'm going to the studio on the 18th of February, and um, I've got uh, I've got a cast of characters coming down. You know, um, that record's only 45 minutes long, so I need you know I need an hour half hour and a half worth of material. Um, so I have a bunch of really cool old kind of like bitch by the stones and do it my way and it's going to sound that way it's going to be very yeah. cool okay news to us right mike yeah you know and it, it some it, it's going to be obscure but but it's all really great songs that i've loved all my life and and that's the joy of making music man i've already had a great career i'm just i can't be blessed anymore um i don't know what else to do other than make music and be happy. We were talking about how, like, what, what would we be doing if we weren't, like, musicians, you know? I mean, we, we are totally unqualified to do anything else but, like, this, you know? Yeah, play, we'd be flipping burgers if we weren't playing, you know, music for people. So that's why you I know. like these NAMM shows. You, you come here and you, because we're kind of isolated when you're on the road, you're in the hotel or you're on the bus and you play a show. and then you, So you're not really, like, in 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 the pool of your fans, like you hear at NAM, you know, you're like, you're surrounded by them. And 
And it's just nice to know that our life's work is like, it means something to people, you know? It's like, it's really important to them too, because it's certainly important to us. I mean, we're, we're all in, you know, we love music and this is- You know, man, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna take that picture every three feet. You know, I'm without the fans, we wouldn't be here and be talking about the music that we love to do. It, that's the truth. Without those guys, we wouldn't be crap. Yeah, people ask, like, what, what's the secret of longevity in this business? And it really is that. It's like you can't look at it like that. You know, it's just like surviving day to day. And then, you know, here we are talking in 2018. And it's like, oh, I remember my first NAMM show in 1990. You know, it's like, uh, where'd the time go? So, so speaking of all the, the touring, is there something that you need to have with you to survive the one thing? toothbrush yeah it's kind of like that yeah. and, really and, like and that. some herbal tea yeah. make, make sure you have your toiletries right <laughs> and a good tech. if you have a good tech that you can trust i've had the same guy for 10 years uh, yeah. great, great what and a great sound man or monitor man either yeah. one crew, crew is key and just uh just taking care of yourself you know it's a long it's a it's a marathon not a race uh, not a not a sprint you know and so you've got all these gigs under your belt. There, are there some that really stand out, some that uh, you really remember fondly? There's some that I, I remember fondly, and then I don't remember, like, what cities they're in even, you know? There's the, like, like when you play uh, Rock and Rio, for instance, you know, or a, um, like the Rock and Rim Festival in, uh, in Germany at the racetrack there, or Mount Fuji in Japan. I, I, there's really, or, or even, like, you know, smaller clubs like that, um, you know, we were, we were talking earlier about the Bataclan in France and all that, you know, but there's there's club gigs that are better than those big ones. You know what I mean? I mean, there's a special magical nights where just sweats dripping off the off the ceiling, literally, you know, especially at, in, at the early Pantera stuff was just, dude, your gigs were insane. You know, that's yeah. those were the ones that made it all the difference. And Phil would stretch these. We just stretch the set. He'd just keep throwing songs in. You know that weren't supposed to be there just to see how hard we could get you know then that's the challenge you know that's 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 what yeah and then then we go backstage for two hours and bitch at each other about the tempos about each song you know yeah i mean there's there's there we played a gig in i think it was finland or norway or something on the last tour and uh we were halfway through our set and just the generator for the whole festival went out so we're didn't know what to do, so we just uh, sat there, and it took about 50 minutes to get the power back on. But what we did is we had all these cases of beer on the sides of the stage, so me and Jerry just went out in the audience and like just were handing out beers to people, and we just we just kind of yeah, so we just kind of hung out with the crowd for like 50 minutes, and so we turned a bad, a really bad situation into a good situation, and there there is no bad days doing this. If, if you're a chump, if you think that, you know what I mean. I have my my. Uh, my uh, cousin Glenda, she's one of my like my sister in life, right? She harvests organs from children who are passing away and takes the organs and and they transfer the organs to other kids who need them, right? So whenever I'm having a bad day on the road, I'm thinking, well, what is my cousin Glenda doing at this moment? You know, so I can't even fucking complain. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, so that's 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 a real job. That's for real shit. Yeah, my buddy. What advice would you give to aspiring musicians? Huh, just really kind of be open to all styles. Be open to like uh, just listen a lot. Don't think don't think you know everything because you don't know shit. <laughs> Me and Rex are thirty years in, we still don't know shit, and yeah, that's probably why we keep doing this. We still want to, yeah. Well, like uh, you know, we're, we just walked in here after a long day at NAMM, and first thing Rex did is he went over and started playing with that new chorus pedal you guys got. You know what I mean? Okay. So there you go. You know, it's always something new and cool here. I mean, I've been blessed. Uh, like uh, with the good drummer Randy Castillo and the Aussie band, the late great Randy Castillo, amazing drummer from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, uh, this guy named Ben Smith and Hart, you know, and um, a good drummer will, will make you feel, you sound great, you know? But if you're great and you're playing with a bad drummer, he'll make you just sound good. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. So I mean, all about the rhythm section, yeah. bass and drums. That's the yes. Think, think about that. It isn't about the volume. It's about where it lives. You know. So bass, bass has to live. It has to live, and it has to live in its own space. You know. Um, 
You know, a lot of these new bands, I noticed they, they kind of just go for the sub lows and they kind of mush the guitars in there. So everything's kind of like one thing, you know, a little different style, which is cool. It's a new kind of style and stuff. But I mean, I was I, I was, uh, you know, listening to vinyl in the 70s. So that's what I'm growing up on. The I like the guitars to be the guitars and the bass to be the bass and the drummer to do his thing. But it all kind of works together. If you, you get those magical combinations like Queen or the Who I'm or something. This you know? Yeah, I was trying to get the balance between having that really good low end and then uh, making the tar where they didn't stick out too much, but they had, you know, where they were prominent, you know, and it, without stepping on the boat. Yeah. Uh, let's move a little bit to music here. I want to ask, um, do you guys have any guilty listening pleasures? I kind of just like it all. I don't even look at music like, like, like I just saw one big thing. And I don't know, it's funny, like, like when I'm at home and I'm bored, like I'll put on like the first Boston record or something and play a long bass with it or something or just just uh, for fun. Yeah. Or, or even like a Cars record or old Devo records, just whatever it is, you know, just something different, you know, something different. Yeah. <laughs> for me, it's about learning those, like I said, the lost chords that are in your head, because sometimes I get motivated playing guitar to play a bass line. I'll, I'll hear that and and see, OK, well, it's, it's going to need something underneath it. And I even did that with the Pantera stuff. You know, um, I wrote all the lead parts, uh, you know, pretty much arranged a lot of the stuff. Don would have the riffs and then we we would sit together and work everything out. Right, you know, every you know, you could use the same microphones in the same room. And for some reason, it sounds different one day. Yeah, it's just it's just. Uh, I mean, Seattle's a great, uh, there's some great studios up in Seattle where I'm pegs from, you know. There's some great bad rooms over here, bad, bad Animals and um, you, you Lang and, and uh, uh, London Bridge still is one of the best drum rooms in the world, you know. But it doesn't look like it would be, you know what I mean? But it's just you never know what, what magic is going to come out of what room, you know. That's the exciting part of this, you know. We'll record all over the house. I mean, it's just nuts. We'll record outside underneath the tin roof. You know, when I was singing, we put one ten, 10 feet away, we put one five feet away, and then have one right on. Then you have the different dynamics, depending on how hard you sing at it, you know. Then you have the breadth. So uh, what Ampeg gear do you rely on? Uh, and Or does it vary by venue? Uh, like, for recording, I still use this old 69 Ampeg I got. I got a 72 and uh, I, I just like keep it basic, you know, I get, I get the, the good growl and stick with it. And yeah, and like we were talking about being blessed by good drummers, I, I've been blessed by great producers, too. So I've learned over the years to just shut the hell up and let them do what they got to do with it. And then, you know, it, it usually comes out good. So, you know, uh, but you're not you're not taking the 69 or 72 heads out on the road, though. Last tour I did. Yeah, and then I, and then I, I'd, I'd sub out, I'd, I'd, I'd sub out some 18s with a couple SVT4 Pros, but there was one point I was, I was doing six 18s, uh, 12 15s, and 24 10s. That was like a you, you sound know. of it, it even out front. Much. Well, much, Greg yeah. Price was doing you guys, oh, it and, and and it just sounded. I've never heard a bass sound that good at a live venue ever in my yeah, we, life. We kind of have a similar tone. We go for the growl, a lot of a lot of action on, on the. But uh, and nowadays we we don't push it so hard like that. You know, it's a, especially if you're playing a theater or something. You can't you can't walk in with yeah. And so we we try to bring the stage volumes down so it gives up the sound guy something to work with up up in the front. Because if you if everybody's that loud on stage and you're playing small places. Like I was doing that when we were, when I was playing with Ozzy and we we're doing big outdoor places, you know. But like if you try to do that indoor place, it's like so loud. Your sound guy has nothing to work with out front, you know. It's like you might as well not even hire a guy, you know, because uh, you know, all you're gonna hear is what's coming off that stage. So yeah. So if you bring down the volumes, that's good for you young kids out there. Keep the volumes down, and yeah. Oh, wear wear, wear earplugs. Yeah, earplugs. Yeah. I'll tell a funny story. Every time these guys would come out and see us play. They would always sit up at the mixing board and tell us, tell the sound man to turn it up. He goes, I can't turn it up right so loud on stage yeah, yeah. that it would drown out everything else. Yeah, and your sound but, man, you forget it. But he loved it. The, the, you know, Vinny, Vinny the, the reverb on the snare took up the whole PA. You know, so you couldn't get any kind of sound going through there anyway. So I just said, crank it up, let's go with six, eight tens behind me. That'll fill on. That'll 
that, that'll push some power and push some air. <laughs> One of the best inventions of mankind is that 810 cabinet. Really, in Frampig, it's one of the best inventions on the planet. It was that 810 cabinet. Yeah, there's nothing like it. Yeah, usually I'm getting my tone now out of my in ears like uh, a lot of the time. You know, the days with the flown side fills. So when I was in Ozzy, we had the flown side fills, regular side fills, wedges everywhere, you know, no in ears and wedges behind you and wedges by the drummer. So you had to have them wherever you were rocking out. You needed, like, you know, and just the volumes back in the day were crazy. Yeah. 28% here and only 8% here. You would think that the cymbals would have got me because I was on that side, right? We were both on the right side. Um, and I made the side feel so loud back in the Pantera days that the guys wouldn't come over to my side of the stage because I'd. You planned it that way, didn't you? <laughs> exactly. Get these guitar players and singers out of my zone. Ampeg rocks. We love you guys. Thank you. Troy from Ampeg, NAM 2018. Awesome. Thanks for coming out, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.